One thing I can tell you for sure is that we're doing it wrong. We're not really legalizing cannabis. Our state governments are allowing some normalization of cannabis so tax revenue can be raised to feed their bursting budgets, but it's little more than that. Also, regulation at the state level is being implemented mostly by folks who have little understanding of cannabis markets, cannabis culture, and they certainly don't get cannabis patients. So far, nearly every state to allow and tax cannabis has done very little to embrace and include the prior prohibition era producers. What do you think happens when you allow cannabis culture to flourish and yet restrict participation by the heritage growers who produce during prohibition? Well, of course, they just keep on producing for the unregulated market like they always have. This could potentially be a huge mess for the future of true nationwide legalization. Does this mean a new drug war 2.0 where law enforcement officers could bust growers not because cannabis is illegal, but because they don't have their tax stamp? This is Boston Tea Party shit. The states give lip service to decreasing diversion to other states, but when state regulators try to dominate a state cannabis market without including the black market, they are directly causing the diversion of product to other states. And for those who choose not to start shipping out of state, their family cannabis business must be dismantled, even though they were the ones helping patients and keeping the flame alive during the dark days of prohibition. And you know what? This mess of diversion, neglected patients, and unstable markets will be blamed on cannabis companies instead of where the blame belongs with the regulators who devise the system. We are doing this wrong, this thing being called legalization. What we are experiencing is industrialization of cannabis and the demise of artisan heritage cannabis farming in America. And I am not down. If you want to learn about cannabis health, business, and technique efficiently and with good cheer, I encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter. Every week, you'll receive a new podcast episode delivered right to your inbox, along with commentary on a couple of the most important news items from the week and videos, too. Don't rely on social media to let you know when a new episode is published. Sign up for the updates to make sure you don't miss an episode. You are listening to Shaping Fire, and I'm your host, Shango Los. My guest this week is Dr. Dominic Corva. Dominic is executive director of the Center for the Study of Cannabis and Social Policy. He is a political geographer and public policy scholar. He is an affiliate researcher for the Humboldt Institute for Interdisciplinary Marijuana Research at Humboldt State University. Dr. Corva's work has been published in the International Journal of Drug Policy, Political Geography, the Annals of the Association of American Geographers, and ACME, a journal of radical geography. His dissertation research examined the political economy of international drug policy in the Western Hemisphere, and his postdoctoral research has focused on the political economy of cannabis agriculture in the southern Humboldt area. Today, we're going to be talking about how the licensed and unlicensed cannabis markets interact. Welcome to the show, Dominic. Hi, Shango. How's it going? It's great to be back. Awesome. So glad to have you here. It seems like it's been a long time since last time we talked during the very first episode. So here we are again. So thanks for making the time for it. I know your time is valuable. Well, I'm super stoked to do it. Uh, you've really done some amazing work on this podcast uh, since that first one. Right on, dude. So, yeah. hey, the, the history of cannabis in America is mostly told through its black markets, which is why we're talking about it today. And, and while there are certainly new markets being created all around the country, you know, these, these informal markets have lasted generations. Do you think that it's unrealistic to think that black markets will disappear simply because a new licensed and taxable market suddenly comes into existence? Well, the short answer is yes, but uh, I actually want to commend you on your use of the plural uh, when you're talking about these things and also how you're actually using uh, several different concepts, black markets, informal markets. And so I, I kind of wanted to just start by just reframing things conceptually a little bit, which is to say that the black market singular is a super problematic concept in so many ways. Um, Black markets help us get somewhere uh, by describing the heterogeneous nature of the different kinds of uh, illicit, informal uh, markets that, that we're talking about. Uh, and another, on another uh, and related note, I've, I've been encountering and I have encountered you know, over the years uh, you know, a certain amount of Resistance to the term black market it doesn't come from you know uh, an anti-black market point of view, but one that is concerned about you know concepts of race and racial justice. And so uh, a lot of folks these days are a little concerned because they feel like it's a racist term. I maintain that it's not, 
Uh, but I do want to kind of respect the fact that folks are actively, you know, working on the stigma aspect of things when they talk through, uh, when they talk about the black markets or informal markets or whatever. So I will also be using, you know, the terms a little interchangeably, black market, illicit market, uh, here's another one for you, legible and illegible markets. Mm. Uh, and to me, um, that gets at more like what the meaning of a black market is. Uh, it is. It is something that is very difficult to read, right? Um, uh, in, in no small part, obviously, because, you know, what we know about it comes through stories, comes through anecdotes, comes through things that kind of uh, – uh, trickle into our consciousnesses, either in, you know, face-to-face -face conversations or, or media headlines. Uh, and so uh, there's a whole range of values attached to discussions about illicit, illegible, informal black markets. Um, that's kind of hard to do that work and still talk about it, you know, with any sense of clarity. But it's very important to note that, you know, what we know about illegible markets are stories, and those stories are framed by interests, and those interests have certain goals. Uh, and certainly, broadly speaking, you know, legal cannabis uh, has as one of its goals the you know the mitigation of the black market. Um, and of course, that's one of the problems is that when their story happens, it's very singular. And when when they're talking about the black market, what are policymakers thinking about? they're usually thinking about organized crime. They're actually not thinking about the, you know, the reality of informal markets that are highly decentralized, uh, uh, livelihood strategies for many people um, in the United States. So uh, I think that when the legal market is talking about getting rid of the black market, let's give them a little bit of credit because, you know, what they're thinking of is not actually the reality, you know, it's, it's, a, it's part of the reality. Uh, and, and it's one that we should acknowledge as well, that organized crime certainly, you know, is part of that ecology of, you know, illegible markets that, that, that we want to be able to talk about. And it is also the one that, you know, I think there's a public interest in, in mitigating, you know, uh, fairly strongly, uh, at the very least, uh, with respect to, for example, you know, uh, very large grows on public lands, uh, you know, that do environmental damage and so forth. Um, I think that there's an interesting economic justice concept lurking behind this legal cannabis desire to get rid of black markets because they're able to frame the issue of cannabis, unlike with the rest of society, as one in which we're, we're actually kind of concerned about the commercialization of uh, of our economy, uh, and I think that there's a there's kind of a I think that there's a channeling going on, the frustration with how our economy works and how we'd like it to work, into this debate about you know getting rid of black markets and not. So, with respect to you know the legal cannabis policymakers' goal of especially, you know, diminishing the structural violence associated with organized crime and so forth, and particularly, you know, highly commercial informal markets. I think that, um, I think that the response that has to say, well, you know what, like, actually, the other informal markets have been doing that work for you for a very long time. And part of the problem here is that you're not enlisting them in your project to actually reduce the harm of highly commercial, you know, uh, you know, barely different from, you know, exploitative capitalism, you know, uh, you know, cannabis industry, which does exist and also, you know, looms very large in legal markets. Um, so is it unrealistic? Yeah, it's unrealistic, especially because they're t using the term black market in a singular fashion and they're referring to organized crime when in fact, medical markets, informal markets that are highly decentralized, the ones that actually over the last 20 years have made, you know, U.S. cannabis consumption uh, usually a mostly local issue as opposed to an imported issue, um, you know, they've been doing that work. They've been getting rid of organized crime by overgrowing it, uh, you know, in the same way that, you know, you over overgrow uh, essentially prohibition. 
Um, so it's a it's an it's an interesting, I think, framing issue that you know policymakers they just simply don't understand. They don't get the you know pluralism of illicit and informal markets and how many of them are actually quite socially beneficial. Uh, and this range is not just to like the small little home grower, you know, uh, with a few plants in the backyard, but, you know, to me, it also applies to, for instance, for example, you know, in California, the unlicensed dispen dispensary system that certainly they've been uh, encountering, especially in Southern California in the LA area in particular, uh, you know, over the last 10 to 15 years. And my argument has always been actually that kind of black market transformation has been quite helpful because it gets cannabis off the streets uh, and, and it, at the very least gets it into, you know, uh, a situation where, you know, people are not, you know, doing this, you know, on the streets and in public and so forth, but there's like a place to go to, to do it. So, you know, the range of like the concern we have about organized crime and public safety should also recognize the ways in which black markets have been actually dealing with themselves, especially because of, you know, the medical cannabis or, or you know, gray market, which is still kind of an informal market, but a little more legible, uh, you know, action that's been going on. Uh, a final note on the black market situation is that, uh, you know, policymakers are attaching a stigma, usually unconsciously, to organized crime and it, it usually is about actually brown people, not black people, because they they use this term, you know, cartels and Mexican cartels usually is the stand in for all organized crime. So it's, you know, it's rare that you hear like a policymaker, you know, talk about, you know, the problem of, you know, gangs, you know, opening dispensaries. Uh, and, and to me, again, whether you view that as a problem or not really depends on whether you understand that, you know what, like this actually gets cannabis off the streets and generally d detaches it from other illicit drugs and, and drug markets. You know, I think that's a really good point that you make that, um, that, that, that the people who you and I both know are artisan growers, are family growers, are, are small undercapitalized producers who we think are the, the, you know, the backbone of the American heritage grower movement that, that because legislators do are not really aware of them and don't necessarily spend time with them and their interaction with those with those folks are, are well actually they think that those folks are all black market they they think unlicensed people are cartels and and mass and so they put everybody who's not licensed in one big basket similar yeah. to how all of we cannabis activists put all of our legislators in one basket as well as not understanding and trying yeah. to limit our freedoms and so it seems like we've got a we've got a we've got a classic negotiation where where each each side doesn't know each other very well. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. But what are the stakes of one not knowing the other? The stakes are much higher for policymakers because they are, you know, uh, entrusted by the public to actually create policy that works. And, you know, their lack of understanding is, you know, what's driving, you know, let's, let's look at Oregon, for example, which already produced way more than it consumed, you know, years ago. And then with legal cannabis coming in, you know, they licensed a whole bunch more, you know, new people and new grows, new licensed grows. They, they, you know, they, instead of, you know, integrating the existing producers in Oregon, you know, they, they doubled their problem. And now they're calling, you know, they're, they're blaming essentially uh, uh, a situation that had developed a long time ago and is not new for exacerbating their oversupply issue, right? When in fact the proper thing would have been to do would have been like, you know, don't issue like new licenses, take the people who are already, especially in the medical programs and, 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 and integrate them, uh, which they did at first. They really did at first. That's how they started was they, they said, you know, adults over the age of 21 may now just purchase at dispensaries and, and, and they, we can tax that right away. Right. So they kind of got off on the right foot. Uh, but then, you know, through their accommodation of, you know, uh, well-capitalized interests who also didn't understand that they were going to have a big problem 
actually making any money in a system that was incredibly, you know, saturated as it was, um, they've created a problem that now they want to respond to with, you know, more policing, which, uh, you know, has always been more of a price support for the black market than uh, for black markets in general, uh, than a, uh, something that actually, uh, you know, controls or, or diminishes, uh, the informal market activities. It seems to me that the, the only way to combat, air quotes, a black market is either to make it smaller by brute force, like, you know, Duarte is doing in the Philippines, or by embracing it and becoming one with it. And it seems like the way that the market is progressing, you know, neither is really happening. The war on drugs didn't work. Legislators generally get that now, and they're embracing it more and more. And yet, um, you know, you already see people who have already received their license in California snitching on other people who have not yet gotten their license because they're all like, now that we have our monopoly, we want to keep all the unlicensed sellers out. And and like you were saying, them not necessarily allowing the heritage growers in. I mean, that's certainly what happened in, in Washington. I mean, we had 18 yeah. years of medical marijuana that, yeah, it could use some regulation and people should have been doing more uh, – um, you know, lab testing once they got access to it. But by taking that entire market and saying you can't play in licensed cannabis, it, our, our, our Washington 502 market, and now we're seeing it happen in Oregon and California, it is structurally creating a black market by not letting everyone play. And do you think that they're realizing that they're doing that? Or do you think that the fact that, oh my gosh, the black market is sustaining, even though we're air quotes, letting them have their weed, right? Do you, do you think that they know they're creating this black market? Or do you think that they are just this ignorant to how social policy is going to interact with the economic policy well i mean i i think that they just lack knowledge whatsoever of the dynamics of cannabis markets uh i think that that's probably the biggest issue uh but i do want to kind of point out something else which is that the the licensed cannabis market is being set up so that you have to be highly commercial because if you are not highly commercial and efficient and able to generate volume at scale, you will not be able to stay open because you will not be able to pay your taxes, which are all extremely high. Uh, you know, you will not be able to pay your license fees. You will not be able to, you know, bribe your local city council to not have a ban, uh, you know, which is how it works, especially in California. Uh, you know, what they're doing is actually taking a critique of, of informal markets that is founded in like, basically, I think a well-grounded fear of like, what commercial, you know, markets do, which is they don't have any regard whatsoever for you know social uh, or public you know benefits or or uh, or positive things for society other than the generating money, and they're creating a system that is just that, it is just just for commercial, highly industrialized, exploitative, you know, for profit, no room to do any good in society, uh, you know, actors. Uh, it's it's it's, you know. And I don't know what to say about that other than like, okay, you have a fear of, you know, unbridled capitalism, basically. And so your response is to create unbridled capitalism, uh, you know, uh, and it's, it's highly counterproductive. It's like once you're talking about the licensed market, now you assume that all the licensed actors are all, you know, good guys. There's no stigma attached to them. Uh and especially if they've got a whole bunch of investment money behind them, you know, uh, you know, from the financial sector, which has been wrecking our economy for the last, uh, you know, who knows how long, 30 years, roughly. Wow. You know, there's, that's, a, that's a lot to chew on. You know, the idea that the, the regulators, you know, they're essentially driving without a map. That's, that's scary in and of itself. Yeah. And, the, and, and the fact that, you know, by the wave of their pen, they are, you know, destroying small family income 
and and you know not no longer holding a place for patience it's an awful lot of power for people who don't know what the hell's going on i would like to i mean maybe i'm too idealistic to think that to the people who are making policy would at the very least get consultants who understand what's going on in the cannabis market is is no one speaking to them and giving them the truth so that they can they can make policy bake, based on the reality of how cannabis markets work so there's two sides to that. Uh, I think that in a very highly uneven and localized fashion, there are a lot of municipalities that are more sensitive to that than others. You can look at, you know, the Bay Area's equity programs and, uh, you know, um, their criminal, the criminal record expungement part of California. You can look at L.A.'s uh, appointment of Cat Packer to be in charge of, uh, you know, what they're doing. And that's someone with a, you know, a civil liberties and social justice background. Uh you know, it, it's happening, but it's highly uneven. And, you know, to some extent, it's not just sort of an issue with the policymakers, i.e. The, the legislators who are making the laws, but it's the bureaucrats making the rules. And the bureaucrats making the rules are not that concerned, you know, about the reality of markets. They're much more concerned about the reality of, of, of politics, uh, and in particular, federal politics. And so, you know, there's there's an element to which you could argue that, you know, the Washington system, it really was not rolled out with any real concern over, you know, justice in the markets or economic justice. They just wanted to, you know, get that system going and do it in a way that modeled deference to federal prohibition. Uh, and I think that, like, there's nothing controversial about that statement. Um, it's quite clear, I think, uh, from the LCB director, uh, from you know, from the folks who are particularly well associated with how our system has gone, that what they're doing is advertising to the feds that the feds, you know, don't come get us. You know, go get somebody else, but don't come get us. So they'll take, you know, confusion with the markets. They'll take a complete breakdown of the traceability system that's supposed to be, you know, the, the cornerstone of, of why it is the feds aren't supposed to come get us. They'll take that all day long, you know, as long as the appearance of deference to, uh, you know, uh, the Federal Department of Justice is there. And I think that that's becoming a little more generalized as well. I think that uh, the way it's evolved towards deference to the feds is a reflection of the licensed industry's desires not to get cracked down by the feds, not just the policymakers' desire not to have, you know, public employees get arrested. I think that as the licensed, uh, you know, the licensed market grows, those people are managing risk, and the way they manage risk is, you know. Well, who could come get us? And if you've got a lot of a lot of investment money, you know your your concern is with the feds. It's not with local police. It's not with you know traceability breakdowns, whatever. If there are you know millions of dollars in uh, you know financial system cash, you know propping up your operation, yes, you want to you want to actually crack down on anybody who's not licensed, uh, and not just because to protect your own competition, but to you know protect your place in the market going forward. So, you know, there's certainly a, you know, a greedy aspect to that, but there's also just sort of a, a risk management, financial risk management aspect to that. That's, it's just cold blooded calculated, you know, no concern for, you know, how it affects the rest of society and in particular the people who are able to get by because they participate in this particular informal market. Yeah, that's a really good point. If 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 what is making the policy is the folks who are bringing the fresh capital into the cannabis market and their primary role is to decrease the risk of the capital, the 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 idea of decreasing the risk for the capital does not leave a whole lot of room for for patients and small artisan folks oh. and the lack of the need of like huge security systems. So so let's go ahead and take our first short break and be right back. You're listening to Shaping Fire, and my guest today is Dominic Corva of the Center for the Study of Cannabis and Social Policy. 
While I certainly still enjoy smoking joints, I moved over to using vaporizers about three years ago. The high was a little different than burning the flower, and in the end I decided I preferred it for daily use, especially because I have asthma. More importantly though, I could taste my flower so much more. It's hard to express to you how significantly different cannabis with a good terpene profile tastes when vaped instead of burned. I have brought my vape with me to visit growers and they are astonished by the clarity of taste and they say they feel like they're tasting their flower for the very first time. The Air Vape Vaporizer from AirVapeUSA.com is a great device to use on the go or at home. When you pick it up, it feels satisfying like a medical device. It isn't flimsy like many vapes are. I like how the flower is inserted in the top instead of the bottom, so it travels a shorter path to my mouth. With the cannabis at the top, I get a hit that feels more substantial, even though I'm just inhaling vapor and not full-bodied smoke. Since I use this vape for flour, hash, and concentrates, I really like that the digital control for the temperature is right there on the front. Three clicks of the button and it fires up to the temperature I specify really quickly and discreetly. You know, vape concentrates are a milder experience than dabbing, but you still get the potency in your hit. Also, the taste is great, as would be expected with a low temp dab. I love that this vape gives quick little vibrations when it gets to the right temperature. That way, if I'm chatting or distracted while it's heating up, it lets me know when it's ready. If you are ready for a nice pocket-sized vaporizer, consider the Air Vape. The new Air Vape X has just come out and it's gorgeous and it includes many updates. You can find more about the Air Vape vaporizer at airvapeusa.com. If you own a cannabis company, you know that finding good business partners, vendors, and allies is an essential part of your role. And building your business in a new industry like cannabis doesn't always make that easy. Canacon is coming to Boston and Detroit this summer, and the halls will be filled with every kind of ally you need for a cannabis company. Technology, horticulture, packaging, marketing, legal human resources, and media, everything you need for your business will be there. And your customers will be there, too. Because Canacon is a premier cannabis business and networking event with nationally recognized speakers and the opportunity to have serious conversations with your business peers and investors. Reserving yourself a booth at Canacon can unlock a lot of doors for you. Not only do you get to network with all the people who pass your booth, but it is not uncommon for Canacon vendors to do a million dollars in business during the event. Canacon Seattle event in February sold out well in advance, so reserve your booths now for Detroit, June 1st and 2nd, and Boston, July 27th and 28th. Attendee tickets are still available for both events. Whether you reserve a booth or attend just for a day, do not miss the opportunity to become a serious player in your market. Visit Canacon.org for tickets, booth reservations, and more information. That's Canacon.org. Welcome back. You are listening to Shaping Fire. I'm your host, Shango Lowe. And our guest this week is Dominic Corva, Executive Director of the Center for the Study of Cannabis and Social Policy. So, you know, before the break, we were talking a lot about a lot about the uh, the misunderstandings that legislators have about the cannabis market as a whole and why they're acting on this through regulation is tending to both kind of make a mess of the situation, but more importantly, uh, sustaining the informal unlicensed market that they're trying to get rid of. And, you know, we all understand that that many regulators, even though more of them understand cannabis than there used to be, so many of the regulators just don't understand that a cannabis is not an unhealthy bad thing but then also b we all know that they want to get their money from the cannabis because they're like oh wow we've got new money to make our budget bigger so that we can take care of our pet programs but me as 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 someone who thinks cannabis is a positive thing i'm not really all that into the state adding a sin tax you know s i n like they do with alcohol or using of gasoline um, where they are they're it, a tax kind of discourages use or says, if you want to use this product, you have to pay extra because it's not good for you. I don't understand where the government gets its right to tax cannabis. Where, where does that uh, work historically, Dominic? Well, there are a number of things going on here. Uh, and, and first let me say that, you know, I'm not sure the, the sort of right to tax frame is, I mean, it definitely gets us going. So let's just roll with it. Uh, you know, obviously, the government, as a term, refers to a whole huge ecology of, you know, public sector bureaucracies. Uh, you know, from the federal down to the very local level, 
And, you know, in each state, there are different powers to tax that are, you know, permitted or not. So obviously in the state of Washington, uh, we are not allowed to have an income tax. And so let's start there. Uh, that makes it very, very important for the legislature to be able to fund public programs, uh, many of which are absolutely essential, uh, such as public education. They've got to find that money somewhere, and they can't tax income. So they tax property, uh, and they do sales taxes, uh, and they have B&O taxes, and there are other business taxes and so forth. Uh, most of those business taxes you know, also – disproportionately punish small businesses uh, as opposed to large corporations that can achieve efficiencies of scale and manage departments that, you know, you know, pay people to avoid taxes and, you know, uh, all sorts of things. So the whole thing is already the tax regime in the state of Washington is set up to, to really, you know, uh, it's there because we need the money for public programs, some of which you know, we may like, some of which we may not, but we can't tax income, which means that you know, this five-year boom in Washington State, especially in King County, Seattle, around Amazon, is the state has not really benefited from that much at all uh, because they have not been able to raise money from income. So they have been raising you know, property taxes, which raises rents. Uh, you know, they've been you know, increasing their capacity to fine and collect fines. Uh, you know, so what's happening with the cannabis industry actually has a parallel in what's going on in the rest of the state in terms of the relationship between taxation and, and, the, and the public good. Now, it's one thing to like sort of like put that into perspective and say that actually the cannabis industry's best move would be to lobby for a state income tax to replace sales taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be... I think uh, one of the smartest things the cannabis industry could do um, because the state is raking it in at 35% uh, excise tax and they don't want a penny less of that, right? Uh, so to replace that, you would essentially have to find a way to replace that revenue and the most obvious place to replace that revenue would be to tax all these higher incomes that have been created in, 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 in Seattle around Amazon in particular. Um, then there's the level of taxation, and, and here I actually just stay on Washington for now. Like we can get to the other states in a, in a moment. I want to actually take a moment to praise Mark Kleiman, really weirdly enough, uh, who at the very beginning of this, one of the things that he did point out was that the state is going to face a challenge not to get addicted to taxes, basically. Uh, that once once they start raking in the money, they're not going to stop raking it in, and they're going to find different ways to really monetize these revenue flows, and especially in the context of a state budget that remains broke, right? It's, it's as broke as it was during the financial crisis 10 years ago because, again, we haven't been able to actually raise income taxes. Um, so there's all this wealth around and no money to manage it. We have this massive homeless crisis, uh, and apparently you know, money, no money to really deal with that. Uh, you know, we remain completely in the hole in public education spending. Our infrastructure, you know, is, <laughs> you know, decaying as in the rest of the country. Uh, and so, you know, I, I do think that, you know, collecting taxes on cannabis isn't necessarily a problem. But the problem is at what rates and, and, and the justice for that rate is going to depend on, well, what kinds of business are being taxed? You know, if it's small businesses, uh, then really high honors taxes is going to put them out of business and centralize the, the actual you know, legal market. Uh, and, of course, what that is going to encourage on many fronts is the folks who are barely able to hang in the legal market because of the taxes are actually going to you know, create new avenues of the black market, right? So diversion, basically. Uh, that this is not just simply a function of like criminality. It's a function of you know, opportunity and also... You know, what is that business owner facing? You know, how are they able to pay the rent on facilities that, you know, have a six-month delay in licensing because the city hasn't gotten to it yet or the LCB hasn't gotten to it yet? And so, like, you know, they're almost forced to, you know, operate the ones who come from, you know, uh, the illicit market in a way that, like, floats the boat until the, you can actually get revenue coming in, Right. So, uh, you know, the, the high taxes, whether or not they're, they're, you know, 
they're just or not, they certainly seem counterproductive with respect to incentivizing diversion in particular. Uh, and that's, you know, at every level. Um, uh, at the other, the other end of it, really, you know, it's because, you know, in Washington State, we, we handed it to the Liquor, Liquor Control Board, right? And Liquor Control Board took a look at their own history of, you know, emerging from alcohol prohibition and, you know, uh, has attempted to sort of copy that, even though cannabis prohibition, alcohol prohibition have, are, are not a very much alike, and neither are cannabis and alcohol, broadly speaking. Uh, you know, you could talk about cannabis and wine, you know, uh, you could talk about even cannabis and liquor when it comes to, you know, uh, concentrates and so forth. But at the end of the day, you have this tax on cannabis products that actually is, really, really takes a bite out of, you know, the botanical product, you know, at the same level that it takes the bite out of these highly processed edibles, concentrates, and so forth. So the tax regime is kind of just screwed in general. Um, it's counterproductive. Is it just? Is it right? Is there a right? Yeah, there's a right to do so. But again, like what's, what's the driving force behind this? Well, the driving force is that in, you know, the beginning of the 21st century, our public budgets are broke. Uh, and they're broke because of a you know, 30, 40 year long process that has seen essentially the privatization of, 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 of gains in society uh, uh, way beyond the ability of the state and legitimacy of the state to actually collect you know, uh, a tax on the wealth that's being produced by the society that we're creating. Uh, so there's a long term bigger problem here. And that is economic inequality in this country. And, the, you know, the high taxes here and there have everything to do with that. Uh, and the question is, well, you know, what do we do about that? How do we fund, you know, public spending? Well, first, you have to actually agree on the idea that public spending is a good idea versus a bad idea. Uh, and... I don't know that, like, I think in this country, like, we've gone to a place where really, like, because we don't see much return for what our, you know, what little pittance we actually, you know, provide for public servants to actually create infrastructure, create, you know, social safety nets and so forth, those are just gone. You know, we, we don't spend money on things that actually help the people who need it. Um, I think there's a legitimate kind of revulsion at funding, you know, that we, the stuff that we fund, the 280E taxes that are actually, you know, a large source of revenue uh, for the federal government right now, you know, that goes straight into, you know, uh, a budget which is like, you know, 56% defense and uh, an ever-shrinking, you know, percentage of actual, you know, social safety nets, uh, you know, spending and so forth. So, so it sounds to me that that actually in how I asked the question, I wasn't actually looking at the perspective large enough. It's like, yeah, maybe a sin tax on cannabis is not really justified or appropriate based on the product, but no one's looking at it at, at, from that regard. They're looking at it as, oh my God, we've got this underfunded budget and how we do state budgets is wrong and therefore we just need to pour money on the beast to buy us through another budgetary cycle and therefore we're going to have massive taxes on cannabis because there's not really anybody pushing back. And, you know, even though you've been using yes. Washington as your examples, it seems like this is the same way it's playing out in every state and is about to play out in California. Yes, there's no question. I think that that's absolutely, absolutely the case. Well, well, that certainly is um, saddening, right? Because I was kind of hoping we'd come out of this with some kind of, uh, of, of path. To, to try to undo cannabis tax. And that sounds like it's wildly naive of me because before we can get rid of the cannabis tax, um, even though they, they just got it, we would have to both fix how the budget is even made, which is a monumental problem. And now you're saying that we would have to replace the money as well. And and those those are both a lot bigger, a lot bigger than just cannabis. So... 
let Jeez. me let me give you let me give you an example of you know a contradiction, which is uh, you know the founder of uh, the Washington Cannabis Association, Martin Tobias, uh, who certainly doesn't like that thirty seven percent tax, and he certainly doesn't like the two eighty e tax, is also one of the big you know uh, funders of uh, the folks who keep Washington State from having an income tax. Uh, so it's like he gets to have his cake and eat it too, right? Uh, which is that like, yeah, there's high taxes, but it's driving out the smaller businesses and, and the bigger businesses can consolidate and take over the market. The cost of those high taxes in the short term is unpleasant, but really like there is no alternative because he's standing in the way of there being an income tax, right? Uh, and people like him. And people like him include, again, every – highly capitalized investment fund investing in marijuana because those people also work against actually a just and equitable taxation system. And, 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 and here we go with really, you know, one of the issues in legal cannabis besides people snitching, which is that the legal cannabis people are not interested in creating a fair or just economy. They have no interest in it whatsoever. Uh, and I think that's, the way that they're able to both complain about the cannabis, you know, taxes, but at the same time do absolutely nothing on their part to, you know, create a society that actually could, in which we could afford to reduce those taxes, is to me uh, something worth keeping in mind. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and it, it seems to me that going forward, um, with everybody looking out for themselves, um, we're probably going to get more of this. The patients are looking out for themselves. The, uh, the, the, the legislators are looking for their own um, reelections and their ability to meet budgets so they're not embarrassed. And the cannabis business owners that are on of a, you know, a, a more capitalized size, um, they're looking to protect their markets. And so we've got uh, not very much uh, coming together in the middle. Let's go ahead and take another short break and be right back. You're listening to Shaping Fire, and my guest today is Dominic Corva of the Center for the Study of Cannabis and Social Policy. Now that the health benefits of terpenes have become well known in the cannabis industry, people everywhere are looking for the purest terpenes without adulterants. The problem with most terpene providers is that they're not sourced naturally and instead are made as a byproduct of refining petroleum, and that's so sketchy. The terpenes sold by True Terpenes are entirely different. They are certified organic, non-GMO, and food grade. That means they are extracted from real plant sources. There are no solvents of any kind used during the extraction process. They are distilled only with steam. That's right, only steam. In fact, terpenes from True Terpenes are so pure that you can eat them. Not only that, but you can stack them with better results too. What I mean is, other companies' terpenes have got a few percent of impurities, and when you stack those terpenes to make a blend, you're adding a variety of impurities that degrade your final product. True Terpenes also has strain-specific terpenes for a wide range of cannabis strains like Durban Poison, Sunset Sherbet, and Granddaddy Purple. True Terpenes has robust and supportive customer service, so your questions will get answered fast and efficiently. If you've shopped for terps before, you know how rare that is. So whether you want to cup your hands to smell some beta caryophylline to calm down after getting too high, or if you want to dab some alpha pinene so your lungs feel fabulous and your mind feels liberated, True Terpenes will provide you with a truly natural experience. If you are a cannabis product developer, these are the terps you want to add to your oil or edible or a capsule or whatever. True Terpenes are simply the best your money can buy. Don't try and make a premium product with substandard terps. Choose True Terpenes for a top shelf experience. Go to shapingfire.com forward slash true terpenes to find out more or click on the link in this week's newsletter. Skinny dipping, humpback whales, beatnik poetry, the Ottoman Empire, soil remediation, interdimensional beings, and tree frogs. These are just a few of the interesting topics you can find in the audiobooks library at audible.com. If you like podcasts like Shaping Fire, chances are that you'll dig audiobooks too. Just like with podcasts, audiobooks speak to you, telling you stories and teaching you stuff. Here's the thing. Audible.com has an offer I want to tell you about. Right now, they're offering a trial of their audiobook service for absolutely free. 
you can go to shapingfire.com forward slash audible and you will get a free audiobook straight up. You can listen to it on your mobile device, computer, or you can download it and listen to it like anywhere. It's really simple. Of course, they want you to subscribe to their service after the free trial and enjoy their audiobooks forever, but you don't have to. All you have to do to get the free audiobook of your choice is to check out the service for free. So that's the deal. Your first book is free, it's easy to sign up, it's easy to quit, and their online library of free books is pretty incredible. Just check it out. Go to shapingfire.com forward slash audible to find out more or click on the link in this week's newsletter. Welcome back. You are listening to Shaping Fire. I'm your host, Shango Lose, and our guest this week is Dominic Corva, Executive Director of the Center for the Study of Cannabis and Social Policy. So during the first set, we, we talked about why the informal market, the unlicensed market uh, still exists, even in states that have got a regulated licensed market and why they're probably going to continue to exist uh, um, for the foreseeable future. And during the second set, we focus very much on the idea of taxation <clears throat> and, and the reason why that's happening and also, you know, the damage it's doing. In this third set, <clears throat> I'd like to talk about the, the, the kind of, of, of market we are creating in the licensed market because, you know, any, the, the, the personality of any market is created both by the people who are in it and the regulatory structures that guide it. And I've got real concerns about the corporatization of cannabis, which historically has been this healing, patient-centric, <clears throat> even for fun, right? Even if you're going to get high and go out in the forest, you were out in the forest being high and hiking. And there was no regulatory structure. But this new regulatory structure and the people who are coming to the market, I'm not so confident that the, the, the market that we are creating is all that healthy. What are your thoughts? Well, we're, 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 we're creating, you know, uh, an industrial market, right? So corporate and industrial are kind of two terms that I want to tie together. Uh, but industrial largely means that, you know, it, it's 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 highly centralized. It's it's attempting to, you know, uh, use economies of scale and branding and marketing uh, to create value uh, for shareholder shareholders in particular, uh, not necessarily for low wage minimum workers minimum wage workers, uh, uh, trimmers, bud tenders, and all getting paid twelve fifteen dollars an hour. Um, there's a there's a difference between like kind of that model, which is you know corporatist uh, industrial. And what we're talking about, we're talking about what was good about, you know, the other kind of black market, which was the decentralized craft version, uh, which sprung up and in many ways uh, is the one that uh, has been turning back the tide of, you know, industrial cannabis, you know, uh, imports from, you know, Mexico by what are essentially, you know, black market capitalists, drug trafficking organizations. Uh, so... I think that it's unfortunate we've gotten to the point where the legal market wants to create this industrial corporate, you know, a model of of uh, of what a legal cannabis market uh, is allowed to be, uh, and their main enemy seems to be, you know, craft producers who really like aren't even in direct competition usually with with the new sort of legal cannabis industry, which is, you know, heavy on the edibles and the concentrates and the vape pens and so forth. And, you know, certainly there's flour, but that flour is not really, you know, because it's happening at scale. It's, it's just, it's, it's, it's not, you know, um, it's hard for the consumer to purchase it based on anything other than, you know, what's on the package, right? Uh, it's not the cannabis itself that matters. It's the package. And so we're, we're, we're allowing for, you know, um, the continuity of what to me is a, uh, an economically destructive model, the corporatist industrial model, uh, from that particular kind of black market. Uh, and we're, we're, we're pitting it against as though it, it could possibly be against, you know, craft cannabis, which by the way, uh, you know, isn't suffering from a problem of oversupply is not having, you know, uh, issues with, you know, pesticides and so forth, uh, and is in fact, you know, getting to people who, you know, do not have 
you know, the financial means to purchase legal cannabis because the taxes are too high and so forth. So, you know, there's a, there's a limited extent to which those markets are really competing with each other. And it's, it's, to me, it's more of the legal cannabis is creating these new cannabis products that are aimed towards new cannabis consumers and older people and so forth. And that's great. That's one of the positive things that's happening. Uh, and there's plenty of room for development on the edible side and the concentrate side and the, the vape pen side for new users. But for cannabis culture enthusiasts who prefer flour, you know, like they don't want to buy cannabis based on what's in the package, what, what's on the package. You know, they want like a direct experience of the product itself. They want it to smell great, taste great. Uh, and, and, and even to know the person who's growing it. The idea that, that the way the markets work right now is that uh, you can't go in and open up a mason jar and get a good whiff of it, and instead you're buying it based on the copywriting on the package is just absurd. I mean, we all know from using the medicine that – uh, that, that your body reacts to a terpene profile that your body knows it needs. And so that's what we're used to going towards. And now, I mean, not, not to mention, like without even going into the sustainability of adding so much plastic to a one gram, right? But out, out, outside of that, you know, the black market will continue to have this power because you can smell the cannabis in advance. There's a social experience of interacting with your, uh, norm, you know, your neighborhood provider. And, and there's more fun too, right? The black market can still use copyrighted names, for example, like all the malarkey going on around the strain Gorilla Glue and the Gorilla Glue company, you know, suing individual retailers for carrying a product called Gorilla Glue. Well, all those crazy names are going to continue to happen in the informal, unlicensed market, which just increases the underground's prestige. I mean, to some extent. I mean, what that what you're referring to really is a branding, you know, development in the unlicensed market that uh, people are trying to carry over into the licensed market. So there's, you know, like when we think about black markets, we usually think about, you know, production and so forth, but actually <laughs> there's been branding in, in, in the informal markets, you know, uh, and in particular strains are, are kind of brands now. And, uh, it's helpful to some extent because, you know, there's some vague correlation generally between, uh, that brand name and, and what it actually is. Um, but it's, it's, it's not that effective. And, and, you know, I don't really mourn, you know, the, you know, the issues that people are, are, are having with, you know, using branding from the black market on, on, on the white market. Um, I do think with it, it actually was one of the problems with the black market is the extent to which, you know, uh, these branding of cultivars has not really matched the reality of, of what it is. Uh, and I think that if you look at the phylos bioscience, you know, um, work that they've done, you know, it, it at least shows you, you know, the, the fairly large, often very large distance between you know, what the brand name is on, the, on even the black market and what the product actually is. So it's, it's fun to do that. And also, you know, those brand names usually have something to do with, you know, the cross that the cultivar came out of. So that the names that end up happening are not that random and often contain a little bit of genealogy in them, which helps, uh, you know, consumers get educated about, you know, uh, well, what's a cultivar, you know, <laughs> wait a second, uh, you know, um, uh, w there's been innovation and we can kind of track it a little bit. Uh, um, but I think that's, I think that it's also important to understand too, that, you know, for especially folks on the East coast and so forth, that, you know, I think that we're, our variation of the black market that is craft and you can smell it and everything um, and, and you have a lot of choice, isn't that well reflected on the East Coast necessarily where like, you know, stuff goes out in bulk and, you know, it may or may not be of the highest quality. Um, and they haven't developed the small scale cultivation system that, that, that we have out West, you know, uh, as much. So, um, I'm not necessarily sure where I'm going with that, but I, cause I try to emphasize continuity, right? And I also want to, emphasize heterogeneity. Uh, and so I want to celebrate, you know, the craft and, 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 and creativeness that's allowed when you don't have intellectual property lawyers breathing down your neck. Um, <laughs> you know? uh, and also to say that, you know, that's not necessarily new either. Uh, that uh, there's been, 
you know, a, a little bit of, you know, inconsistency that now, you know, has carried over into the white market, probably because of, you know, the Leafly periodic table, which is completely absurd. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to circle back around before we close here. Uh, you know, before before I drifted you off down the the branding path, uh, you were talking about the commercialization of cannabis versus okay. social policy, yeah. and um, and I, I I feel like you probably have something more to say on that because yeah. you know what what do you really think is the future of cannabis based on how the regulatory structures are presently evolving? Well, the future of legal cannabis. I think that there's definitely room for um, uh, well-made, well-crafted, you know, uh, cannabis, a, a lot of the microbrew uh, part of the alcohol industry. It is not a very large part of the overall industry, but we are definitely moving towards, you know, a system in which you have, you know, the cores and the buds and, and so forth kind of dominating uh, the volume. Um I think that uh, that's where we're headed to with the current situation. Um, and I think that the craft aspect to it and the innovative, you know, uh, difference, differences that in the terpene profiles, profiles and so forth, the, the non-standardized, you know, uh, product that results from non-standardized production systems, um, there's going to be some of it in there, but like we're definitely, it, it favors the very large sort of industrial, corporate, commercial products that I'm not that interested in for anything else either. You know, like I'm a no logo guy, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm not into, you know, standardized, you know, uh, products made by, you know, uh, sweatshop workers in China. Right. Uh, and of course, you know, that's kind of where we're headed towards the sweatshop workers in China model, which is a return to, you know, the, the organized crime model, really, which was, you know, didn't benefit, you know, the, the laborers who worked in the fields as much as it benefit, benefited the, you know, uh, the DTO chiefs and, and the, the government officials they paid off. Uh, it's it's kind of like, well, all right, so we've decided that the legal model is going to be the cartel model of production. And I think that that's just ridiculous. And I don't want that. And um I do feel like that's kind of where we're headed right now. Uh, but California is a place where this is getting played out in a way with a lot more resistance. Uh, you know, we have very, very large trade groups there that are, that have been on this since the beginning, uh, a, a concern about commercial, you know, capitalist cannabis basically. Um, uh, and by capitalist actually, I don't mean necessarily anything other than financial capitalists. You know, uh, because I do believe that, you know, there are different kinds of capitalism and certainly small business capitalism is is helpful and worthwhile uh, as opposed to the kind of capitalism that devours small businesses, which is financial capitalism. Right on. That makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> and it makes me really hope for for how California plays out. I mean, I know you and I both spend a lot of time down there, both with the with the, the heritage producers and with the transitioning retailers. And, and, you know, I spend a little time with legislators. You certainly um, spend a lot more time down there with those folks than I do. But, but you know, California being as big of a market as it is and having so many forthright people involved and having so many, you know, really top notch um, uh, cannabis trade organizations in the state, um, hopefully they will be able to push back against things like the removal of the the one acre cap and and you know the local moratoriums and a handful of other things that that can could make or break California. So so for those of you in California who are listening, um, our hearts and minds are with you, and we, we really hope that you uh, that you really do us all right because you know the way that California goal goes is probably the way that the rest of the country is going to go. I mean, the, 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 those of us states like us in Washington who have you know been the first to you know normalize, if not legalize. Um, we were we were more test states, but California is like the big leagues now. And if they can pull it together and push back against some of these policies that are a mess in, in the early to um, regulate states, uh, I think it'll have a lot of impact on uh, the rest of the country. 
I share those sentiments completely. Yeah, we're we're here pulling for you, California. <laughs> right on. Help any way we can, but like, if things are going to change, it's going to be because of you, not because of what happens here in Washington. Dominic, thanks so much for being on the show. You know, I always love having you as a guest uh, because you approach this in such a clean acad- academic way and without all a lot of the hype that not only you get online, but but also comes with some of my other uh, kinds of guests. So so thank you very much for for sharing your um, your you know uh, ability to get right to it and lay it all in historical perspective. So thank you very much. Thank you, Shango. Always a pleasure. If you'd like to learn more about Dominic Corva and the Center for the Study of Cannabis and Social Policy, you can visit CannabisAndSocialPolicy.org. There's a wealth of good reading uh, on the blog there for folks interested in the reality of cannabis policy. And if you really are a wonk, if you loved this episode and you want to hear more of this, make sure you go back to Shaping Fire episode number one, where Dominic Corva and I talk about a policy transfer between the states and how likely it is that early Early to adopt states will be influencing the policy of the rest of the country. You can find more episodes of the Shaping Fire podcast and subscribe to the show at shapingfire.com and on Apple iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. If you enjoyed the show, we'd really appreciate it if you'd leave a positive review of the podcast wherever you download. Your review will help others find the show so they can enjoy it too. On the Shaping Fire website, you can also subscribe to the weekly newsletter for insights into the latest cannabis news and product reviews. On the Shaping Fire website, you will also find transcripts of today's podcast as well. For information on me and where I'll be speaking, you can check out shangolos.com. Does your company want to reach our national audience of cannabis enthusiasts? Email hotspot at shapingfire.com to find out how. Thanks for listening to Shaping Fire. I've been your host, Shango Los. 